So, my hope is, this is the first time you've ever heard a sermon on Revelation chapter 8, 1 through 6. That's my, that's something that I, I get excited about, is preaching a passage that's not usually looked at. We tend to hear the same messages over and over, and they're powerful, and we want to go to the old truths and find new revelation. That pun was not intended. But, sorry. <laughs> but... I think that there's something in, in studying the passages that we tend to overlook, that we don't look at, and, and, and there's a, I feel like a joy in my heart, even a calling on my heart to study out those less studied passages, and so I hope that Revelation 8, 1 through 6 will be the first time maybe that you've heard a sermon and not the last time. So the, the way that this whole message started was actually we had a staff retreat recently, and this was kind of the first jumping back in after a year of being apart, and it was with Gina, Pastor Susie, Pastor Caleb, and, and Mina, and just a really good time to connect our hearts and get on the same page, and then on the last day, we also met with the elders, and the thing that really stood out to me, really the, the highlight for me, other than playing Mario Kart with the boys, it's Nintendo Switch, has, it's come, come a long way since when I used to play Nintendo 64, but other than that, the, the highlight for me was we, we listened to a sermon together by a worship leader named Jeremy Riddle. I don't know if you've heard of him. And he, he gave this message and asked this question, how can our church service attract God and not man? How can we as a church attract God as our first priority? I'm so grateful, I just want to say, to honor Pastor Susie, to have a pastor that truly searches after this, that wants this, to have a place that's a resting place for God. And the sad part is that this is actually countercultural a lot of times, even in churches. Even though we say, obviously, God is our priority, the way that our metrics look is that we're about attracting man. It's always the temptation. In fact, I was looking for that very sermon. Please give it to me later. I was trying to do a Google search, how to attract God. I write how to attract and what comes up. Five ways to attract new members. Seven ways to attract people to your church. Eight characteristics that attract young adults. How to attract millennials. And it goes on and on, and I never actually did find the sermon. That's the temptation we always face. Let's bring people through the doors, gain new members, Increase our tithes, keep everyone happy, but that can't be our first goal. As a Christian community, we need to be asking, how can we build this place for God? We want our church to be one that abides with him, as Pastor Susie shared in John 15. It's not just individually abiding with Christ, we need to do that, but our church needs to be one that truly abides with him. And that's the question, the ultimate question for ministry. How can I partner with you, Jesus, in building a church for you that honors you, that worships you in the way that you want? Because we want people to be attracted, sure, but it's not because we have attractional initiatives, basically. It's not a good welcoming program. It's not that we have you know, excellent ideas of, of how to bring more people into our church. It's because they see the light of Jesus. If we create a resting place for Christ, people who come into our church will see the glory of Christ and they'll want that. We want to ensure that what we're holding on to as a church community are these revealed principles that God gives in the Bible. There's a lot of flexibility actually in terms of how to build a church in the sense of like church hierarchy, for example. We have what's called an Episcopalian model. All that means is that we have a senior church-led uh, community. There, you may have grown up in uh, something called a Presbyterian model where you have different elders that are leading, and those kind of things are actually up to your own choice. There's principles that we follow, but there's a lot of flexibility into how you do it in terms of your style of ministry, but there are principles that God says no matter what you can't compromise on. And if we want to be a church that attracts his presence, we want to find out what are those principles we don't get those first and foremost from a great leadership book. We don't get those first and foremost from attending a seminar, even with other pastors, and saying, hey, I see your discipleship program. It's really good. Can you teach me some stuff? That's valuable, and God wants us to interact with other churches and learn best practices. But the primary way that we learn these principles, of course, is from the Word of God. And as 
Pastor Susie asked that question through Jeremy Riddle, I felt like it was an assignment in some ways to Pastor Susie that she's asking this question, and so it behooves us. It's necessary for us as leaders to search this out. How can we make a resting place for God? But I feel like ultimately it was God's assignment to me, and I even believe it's God's assignment for us, that that would be the dream of our heart. We're asking the question, how do we make a resting place for God? And we're studying the scriptures to find out what that is. Because if it's not that, if Jesus is not in our midst, it's not even church. I'm not going to waste my time just showing up and coming to a place that doesn't have the presence of God. There's a lot of great social activities out there. But the church is known to have the presence of God. And so that's my sermon title today, is a church that moves Jesus. That's what we want. It's not about me first being moved, as, as Lee mentioned, It's not about me getting fed. It's about having a church community that moves Jesus. And that's a church that has the presence of Christ. So my inspiration of looking for where these principles are, again, it's the whole word of God. We need to be as a community corporately searching this out. But today we're going to look through Revelation. And the reason I chose Revelation as my starting point as this assignment unto God is because it's the most explicit throne room encounter that we have in all of the Bible. Throne room encounter meaning where we see the throne of Jesus and what's happening around the throne. The other two passages that come to mind are Ezekiel chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 6. This is where we see the atmosphere of worship in heaven. And as believers, for nothing else, we want to just be seeing what our future home is going to be looking like. We want to be seeing what the atmosphere of worship is like. But unto this question of, God, how do I build a resting place for you? How do I build a church expression that pleases you? I'm reminded of Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5. It says, the church that's in heaven is actually the real thing. There's a tabernacle on earth that's a copy of the real thing. And Jesus is saying, it's not that hard. (laughs) You need to look at the original and copy it. Find principles you know, you can ask other, other ministries and get ideas, but at the end of the day, I want you to copy what it looks like in heaven. And that's a church that moves Jesus. And so through this lens, I want to be sharing just in the last couple of weeks as I've been meditating and thinking and asking specifically from the book of Revelation, what does a church service, the original, look like, and how can we get that in our community here? What are the principles that no matter what, Jesus says, don't compromise on. And so I'm going to quickly move through the first four and then spend time on the fifth one, which is where our passage is for today. Just to lay a groundwork here of principles that I see. Through this lens, I want to share these five points. A church that, number one, pursues holiness together. We see in the book of Revelation, chapter 6, verse 11, that the saints are wearing white robes. And we find out in in chapter 19 later that the white robes speak of the righteous deeds of the saints. Of course, it does not mean that the saints were perfect while they were on earth. It's only the righteousness of Christ that has any merit. But they pursued holiness. They sought to honor God, and they turned to Jesus in repentance and trusted him to save, not just one time, Not just in a sinner's prayer meeting, but continually they were turning to Christ. And the truth is that temptation to water down a message of holiness is going to continue to get greater and greater and greater. It's hard as it is right now to say there's a line and Jesus says this is the truth and we need to live a life of holiness. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, that the time will come when men will not be willing to put up with sound doctrine. And they will say, preacher, you come up here and tell me that the way I'm living is okay. They will heap up for themselves teachers because they have itching ears. And, of course, the truth is that we're all impure, we're all sinners. And the way that we call people to holiness, we can improve that. Right? There are criticisms that, that the church is given that you're hypocritical, you're harsh, you accuse, and sometimes just the world hates Jesus' righteousness. 
But other times we actually can have an ear to how can we do this better? But at the end of the day, there's no way to skirt this, that Christ calls for holiness. And he wants us to, as a community, pursue this together. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? It's he who has clean hands and a pure heart. The church actually, the, the word you may have heard this in Greek, ekklesia. There's basically a few Greek words that everybody knows. Agape, Pastor Caleb did that. This one, koinonia and amen, right? Ekklesia just means called out. Ek, out of. Kaleo is called. Ekklesia, they're the called out people. Old Testament and New Testament, it's the same. If we're the church, if we want to be a church that moves Christ, or even the church, Jesus says, you need to be pursuing holiness. And so we don't do it in our own strength. We pray for that seal to be placed on our heart, as Pastor Susie shared last week from the Song of Solomon. We ask for grace to have wholehearted love for Jesus and undistracted devotion. And again, we can improve in the style that we do it as the church has been called hypocritical. Jesus has an answer to that. He says, remove that log out of your own eye so you can help your neighbor remove the speck out of his. And so often we just see that the things that we hate most of, of sin in other people tend to be the, the issue that I deal with the most. You know, I get so annoyed when I, when I see pride in someone. Why? It's because... <laughs> So we need each other, we need to encourage each other and pursue holiness together. Number two, I see a church that intercedes together. Revelation is full of this idea of the prayers of the saints filling the golden bowls in heaven. Revelation 6, I see the saints crying out to God to avenge the martyrs. How long, O Lord, until you do something, until you bring this justice that you promised? In fact, Luke 18, Jesus talks, talking about his return, he says, when I come back, am I going to see this night and day prayer happening? Am I going to see this prayer for justice happening over and over and over again? Will I find faith in the earth? Faith is defined by, by prayer. A church that moves Christ is a, is a community that prays without ceasing. God, in fact, will not act without the prayers. God can he doesn't need to do anything. He can move of his own strength and of his own power, but he chooses to wait for people to cry out to him in unison, together, and fill up the bowls in heaven. I love this verse from Exodus chapter 2, verse 24. It says, God heard, speaking of the Israelites, the slaves, it says, God heard their groaning, and then he remembered his covenant to set the slaves free. God is not just moved by pain, God has immense empathy for those who are suffering, for the orphans, for the widow, for anyone who's in brokenness and hurting. But he will not just move based on pain. He moves based on the church gathering together and praying for justice. A church that moves Christ is a church that is praying together. Just like Jesus, we also will forever be, be praying. That's what it says about Jesus. He forever lives to make intercession. I love this truth that the saints that are praying here in Revelation 6 are actually the martyrs, meaning they've already died. We're not just praying here right now. Actually, in all of eternity, we're going to be praying. Prayer is the eternal way that we move God's heart. It's not going away. We agree with God's heart and purpose for the earth and his people in all of eternity. Number three, I see a church that worships together. We see the 24 elders in worship casting their crowns before him. Their sense of identity, their accomplishment, even the accomplishment that Jesus himself gave them. Well done, good and faithful servant. They give it back to God over and over and over again. I think of that when I give money, for example, tithes and offerings. I'm giving of myself, my time, my energy, my, my heart. I want to give it all fully back to him. We see instruments in heaven. Wasn't it awesome when Eugene brought up the, the cello recently and started playing that? I hope to see more and more instruments. Jesus is moved by, by instruments of worship. Singing together around the throne, there's millions and millions that are, that are worshiping and singing to him. 
the elders, the voice of many angels, thousands and thousands in unison together. We worship him, lift him up, and praise him in the good and the bad days. Number four, I see a community that uses the Bible together. Prayer by itself actually is not powerful. Worship by itself is not powerful. It's powerful when it's connected to the Word of God and facing towards Jesus. Of course, worship is powerful, but a worship song that's not Jesus-centered is actually not worship. Sometimes I think of prayer like if I'm fasting and praying every day for three months for a new Ferrari, I don't know that that gives God glory. It's praying according to his will, that which he reveals in Scripture. And I want us to see for a second, Revelation 5, 9 through 10, we see this worship that's coming forth. You see this kingdom of priests. You see the blood that's ransoming. And actually, when you study the the Old Testament references, it's pretty clear that they're basically quoting Scripture. They're praying a new, they're singing a new song, but it's based on the foundation of the Word of God. We see in Exodus, Isaiah, and Daniel, this demonstration of this priesthood. They're singing and, and, and praying this out. In Leviticus, we see the blood's atoning nature. That was all the way back from, from Genesis in the garden. Our worship and prayer must be bathed in Scripture. We honor and we magnify the Word of God, and that's a community that will move Christ. And now, finally, number five, this was the motivation for me to actually choose this passage, was I was reading it a couple of weeks ago, and I just felt this excitement and and joy stir up within me. And it was a a verse that I'd read many times that this time it, 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 it left something different in me. And I wanted to share it together. So our passage for today, again, is it says, when he opened the seventh seal, that's Jesus, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I began to ask, what about this silence, Lord? You know, after that, we see the angel comes and he he takes this the the incense and he mixes mixes it with the censer and throws it down to the earth. We see fire and earthquake and this really intense scene. And then the angels come and blow the trumpets. So what's the what's the context of this passage? Before we consider this meaning of silence. First of all, if you see on the chart here, we have a chart I want you to see. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. This is a centerpiece of Revelation. There's basically 21 judgments that Jesus, is re- that Jesus releases against wickedness, against darkness, against an evil empire that will, I believe, arise in the, in the final days before he returns led by what in Revelation known as the beast or the Antichrist. And according to Revelation 11.15, this is the moment that Jesus takes control of all the kingdoms of the earth. I believe this is the moment that actually Jesus comes back, that all creation is waiting for this moment when Jesus will come back and take what is rightfully his. That will be at the seventh trumpet. Right here, we're at the transition from the seventh seal to go to the trumpet. In the final three and a half years of human history, there's been worship and prayer that's been going nonstop, and then all of a sudden it's completely quiet for 30 minutes. Now, if it just said in the library it was quiet for 30 minutes, it wouldn't mean very much, would it? This is heaven we're talking about. There's thunder and lightning and and colors like you cannot believe, the jasper and the sardius and the emerald. We see millions and millions that are worshiping. You see uh, in Isaiah 6, it talks about these seraphim that cover their eyes with their wings and their feet, and it's like a dance party going on. And then it's silence. 
Heaven doesn't know about silence. So what is it about this moment that captures the attention of all of heaven where Jesus as the great worship leader is like, let's stop. Shh. And he silences everything as they wait. So at the moment of the greatest transition in human history, before Jesus splits the sky, before he shouts, before you hear the trumpet blast, there's a moment where Jesus says, I want everything to stop, even the really awesome worship and prayer that's happening, and I want you to just stop and watch me because I don't want you to miss this. And I felt this, this joy that, that built up inside my heart and I, and, I, and I believe that the Holy Spirit wanted to teach me something, that actually it's not just worship that moves God's heart, it's not just intercession that moves God's heart, but there's actually moments in which he says, I want you to stop and be quiet and listen because I'm doing something different. And I, I began to ask, is it possible that other passages speak about this same idea, that before you act, before you release a great, powerful move, that you want us to have moments of silence. And I began to think of a couple of passages. Number one is the story of Jericho. Those who have been in Sunday school, you know that story of going around seven times and blowing the trumpets and shouting and Jericho falls down. But I looked at that passage again, and I want us to see this. Joshua chapter 6, verse 10. It says, Joshua commanded the people, you shall not shout or make your voice heard, neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. In other words, it's not just the trumpet blast, it's not just the screaming. There's actually a moment of silence, getting ready in expectation that prepares the way for everything to shake. In the beginning as well in Genesis, of course I think the beginning is the let there be light. But then I thought back to that passage right before that, it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. It was, dark, it was darkness. It was formless. It was complete quiet. The Trinity was in expectation and excitement. Like, it's about to come. It's about to come. Who knows how long they were there? But darkness and, and void for a long, long time. You can debate with scientists about how long that was. But it was quiet. They were waiting, and then, and then the moment comes, let there be light, and there was light. Before God transitions, I believe that there's a pattern of silence where he says, I love that worship, I love that prayer, but I want you to wait for a minute. I'm doing something different than I was before. And if you don't stop and look, you're going to miss it. Because even if you're in Scripture, you know you can miss it. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think that, you know, they, they testify to me, which they do, but you're not willing to come to me. There are times in which he, he says, I want you to pause that. I want you to pause that worship. I want you to pause that prayer. And I want you to just watch because I'm going to do something. Before Jesus acts, there's a moment of silence. And I believe that a church that moves Christ is actually a community that is silent together at key divine moments as well. We see in Habakkuk, it says that Jesus is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Zechariah chapter 2, Be still before the Lord, all mankind, because he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. Jesus loves silence. I realize he actually created it. You know what it says about hell? There's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's constant chaos and pain. There's no moment of, of divine silence, of resting in his presence and watching him. 
God is telling us what he wants, moments of divine stillness. He wants the wholehearted worship. He wants intercession and faith. But I also see that he wants times of stillness where we just wait for him to act. And so I, I believe that we need to, as individuals, cultivate individual times of quietness before him. We see Jesus modeled a life where he would often withdraw to be alone, to be quiet, to cut out distractions, to hear from the Father. When it was dark, Jesus went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus would often withdraw to lonely places and pray. I believe as individuals we can do this by cutting out distractions, having moments where we quiet ourselves. Maybe the worship helps us to enter into it and we're talking with God and but then also there's moments where he's like, just, just listen. Sometimes we can get so caught up in talking, 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 even to God. And we're like, why are you being silent, God? And I can imagine he's leaning over the balcony of heaven and saying, why aren't you be, being silent? If we were silent, maybe we would hear from him. Sure, we need to learn how to cut out distractions in our life. I love it says that Jesus got up. And then he went to his quiet place to go pray. We have to make hard choices to turn off that, the constant noise of whether it's the, the, the iPhone game, the Netflix, the you name it, to be able to hear from the Lord. But also as a church, I imagine that the more we learn to wait in his presence and slow down at times where we sense him moving, the more we actually are going to see him move on our behalf. When we were asked at the retreat, what would a church that attracts God look like? A thought came to me. One in which we are slower. What would a church that attracts God look like? I felt like it was a church that is slower. Not necessarily longer. I'm not saying our services should be three hours long, but that we're willing to slow down, to be able to be silent at times and hear, oh, maybe God wants to shift this. Maybe you're preaching a sermon and we're like, you know what, I, don't, I feel like God wants me to stay here. I'm willing to cut out the other points of the sermon. I want to just take a moment and slow down and be silent and listen. Maybe our, for our worship leaders, you know, you have the three-set playlist that's planned. And while we plan to go through the whole set, you just feel like, I'm going to slow down and stop. I'm going to be silent and wait to, to hear what he's doing because even though the worship and the prayer is really good, there may be a moment where he says, slow it down. I want you to be silent and hear what I want to do. I don't know exactly what that application looks like to be a church that is silent. The principle is easier to proclaim, but I believe the Holy Spirit will give us wisdom on how to move forward in this idea of stopping, being slow. Sometimes it may actually mean we're going to be, be silent completely, but I will say that like what just happened with the, with the ordering, if it's not spirit-led and we're just sitting there, it may feel a little bit awkward. <laughs> but there are times in which Jesus says, shh. Have you ever had that where you're like in an, you know, the, the worship service, all of a sudden you'll go a cappella and it's quiet in the room for a few minutes and then all of a sudden you hear these these songs bellowing from within where the, the worship of Christ is coming forth, if it's truly spirit-led, it's powerful. We don't just make that stuff happen. We're not just going to say, oh, for five minutes, let's be quiet here without the spirit leading that. But I do believe that there's moments in which he'll actually call us if we're asking for this. We're asking to attract his presence where we're going to stop and listen and shift, even in service, based on what he would lead us to. I see this through a man named Lonnie Frisbee. Has anyone in this room heard this name, Lonnie Frisbee? He was a, a preacher, a hippie preacher, during what's known as the Jesus People Movement in the 60s and the 70s in the U.S. when there were all these hippies. So it's like this free love, drug culture, Woodstock, usually protesting against Vietnam, and long hair. If you've ever seen the show, that 70s show, they all looked like that. But this man, Lonnie Frisbee, he was known to wait, be silent during his time of preaching. He would just wait and linger in the, in the place of the Holy Spirit. And this is what I was testified about this man. He said that Lonnie Frisbee was known for his quiet yet intense preaching. 
he would sometimes just stop and be silent for a minute. In the middle of his preaching, that's hard to do. We don't want to be silent for five seconds. We immediately try to fill it up. We say ums and ahs. We don't like that silent silence, do we? But he would be silent for a minute plus, and he would just say, God is working. He would say, I'm just going to stop talking. And they would wait. And then it would happen. You would hear someone softly weeping a few rows back. Lonnie might say something like, there is no need to be afraid anymore. God has his arms around you right now, and he is not letting go. Just be with him. Lonnie taught me a lesson I have never forgotten. The most powerful thing you can do at ministry is listen for God and watch what he is doing and go there and do that. That was Lonnie's greatest gift. He could see and hear what God was doing. He wasn't a miracle worker. He would be the first to tell you he had no power but he would just stand in front of a congregation, wait for God, and then he would list off things that God was doing in the room. This is what I want to see in our community, where we're willing to take risks sometimes. It's going to be messy, actually, when you pursue this. It's, not, you know, it, it's easy if Jesus just showed up in the flesh we would all be quiet naturally. I wouldn't have to tell anyone, hey, we're just going to take a moment of silence. We would just wait for whatever Jesus wants to do. Tell us, Lord, we'll do it. Were we in the middle of that, of that song? We'll stop it if you want to shift. We're in the middle of this prayer. We'll, we'll stop it. It would be a lot easier if Jesus showed up in the flesh and, 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 and said what he wanted. But the truth is we're pursuing the prophetic, which means what is God saying? What is God leading? How is he leading us as a people? And sometimes you'll take a stab and then realize later, oh, maybe that wasn't God. But I think that's worth the risk. That for worship leaders, for preachers, for our community, for those who are house church leaders, that we would take moments in which we're willing to, if we sense God is shifting what he wants to do, we're in the middle of the set, we'll go to a moment of silence. Whether that's literally or metaphorically, I mean being silent and waiting for God and then moving based on his transition. This is what I want to see in our community. Because if it's God at the end of the day, it's worth it. And that moment of silence was a thunderous worship. It wasn't like they were worshiping and then they stopped worshiping. Actually, that moment of silence was what God led them to. And they're just gazing upon his beauty and worshiping him. I want to invite the worship team up. Now we're going to sing in, in a minute the song that I love called The Heart of Worship. And it was actually part of that teaching that Pastor Susie led our, our retreat through in which he mentioned the origin of this song. So Matt Redman is the one who made this song and it was actually from a period of apathy within, within the church. You could say it was a church that wasn't really attracting God. It was more, more about attracting man and the consumer culture in Watford, England. Despite the country's contribution to the worship revival, Redmond's congregation was struggling to find meaning in its musical outpouring. There was something missing. So you know what the pastor did? He said, we're going to cut everything. We're going to get rid of the sound system, the band for a season, and gather together with just our voices. They were willing to silence the instruments, Silence everything that was producing a, in their heart at the time, producing a me-centered focus on worship and not attracting God. Got rid of everything. His point was that we'd lost our way in worship and the way to get back to the heart would be to strip everything away. Reminding his church family to be producers in worship, not just consumers. The pastor asked, when you come through the doors on a Sunday, what are you bringing as your offering to God? Matt says the question led to some embarrassing silence. But eventually, 
in times of just waiting on the Lord, in times of shutting down any performance culture, eventually, that's the key, eventually, there, there's an awkwardness and a pain and a difficulty to truly take those moments of silence before him. But eventually, people broke out into acapella songs, heartfelt prayers, encountering God in a fresh way. Before long, the musicians came back, the sound system came back, and they gained a new perspective that worship is all about Christ. He commands a response to the depths of our souls, no matter what the circumstance and setting. The heart of worship simply describes what occurred. When the music fades, when all is stripped away, maybe Jesus himself strips it away and says, I want you to just be silent before me. And I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, Jesus. Before we sing, I just want to take a minute. I just want to take a minute where we're silent before him. And if this is in your heart, I want you to ask that this would be a church that would attract God, no matter the cost. As a church community and as an individual, I want to be someone who attracts you, God. I want our church to be a church that attracts you. Just take a minute. Ask for that heart of worship. We're praying and believing for transition to happen, that the Holy Spirit would increase in our midst. But I wonder if he's saying first, I want you to be silent before me. Take times to calm your heart. It's not just the absence of noise, but it's silence and turning to Jesus that's our worship. Show us how to live this, Lord. peace that I give you, the peace of stillness, is not the peace that the world gives. But I'll bring that heart of worship. Just take me back to the heart of worship. May we be a community that attracts you. Let's sing together.